Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back to our uh, daily briefing uh, post Hurricane Fiona. Um, today, I'm joined by uh, Tanya Mullally from EMO, uh, Kim Griffin again from Maritime Electric, and uh, Captain James Ryan, the, command uh, the commander of the PEI Military Task Force. Uh, uh, as we continue to make progress, and uh, Captain Ryan, Tanya, and Kim will share that with us in a few moments with their updates. Uh, uh, and we're grateful that the weather is cooperating with our cleanup, uh, and it looks to be for the next couple of days. So that's uh, that, that's been a help, and any help we can get now is an important. Um, as a government, we continue uh, to identify the challenges uh, that Islanders face, and we're doing everything we can uh, to get that needed relief out to Islanders as fast as possible. Um, as I know all Islanders can appreciate, uh, certainly having having lived through uh, far too many of these crises for the last three and a half years. Uh, it's an overwhelming task at the best of times to be everything to everybody, uh, uh, but uh, it, that's even more difficult in the time of crisis. But I do want to tell Islanders that we are working as hard as we can to do everything we can for as many as we can as fast as possible. And we do this in knowing that it is a very imperfect process. Um, our relief programming is also imperfect in that it isn't by design, uh, uh, just and by reality, enough money to be everything to everybody, to make everybody whole. Uh, but we're trying as hard as we can to do that and to help as much as we can, as fast as we can, as I said. And so I do appreciate the understanding and patience of Islanders in, in this regard. Uh, in, in the face of that, though, our work continues. Um, we know and have heard from Islanders tip to tip that there is significant uh, food spoilage out there, in particular because most of our homes were knocked off electricity and we're making our way back from that. Uh, I was encouraged to hear from our insurance companies that if you are insured, uh, that uh, freezer food spoilage is covered, uh, and that's a big relief for many. Uh, however, uh, we know that there are many Islanders, many Highlander homeowners and tenants without insurance. Uh, we're finalizing the details of a program that we hope to announce as soon as tomorrow uh, and trying to find the most efficient way we can to get money out to those Islanders who are impacted as fast as we can. But there'll be more details, I hope, in the morning uh, or, or later uh, in the day even if we have it uh, to share with Islanders in that regard. Uh, we're, we also know... Uh, that there are a number of seasonal employees uh, who have been impacted, employers and employees, and maybe are forced to end their seasonal season early uh, because of what's happened with Hurricane Fiona, and, and the, so they won't be continuing into the fall. Uh, this means, of course, that many Islanders uh, may be without enough insurable earnings uh, to file for EI if you're in a, a seasonal uh, job. And our government is working on the final touches of a uh, program that we will likely call the, the Emergency Jobs Initiative. It's a program that will help island uh, businesses uh, hire new people quickly. Uh, government will be there to, to help uh, in a significant way uh, to make sure that that can happen as fast as possible. We know many island businesses have been challenged with labor, and that has only been exasperated by uh, 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 the impacts of Fiona. So this uh, employee, uh, this emergency jobs initiative program uh, will provide funding to businesses to hire more islanders faster. And as I say, there'll be more details uh, announced on that tomorrow. Uh, we announced the Provincial Disaster Assistance Fund, and then uh, uh, that will be uh, available uh, for Islanders, uh, individuals, businesses, and municipalities for, for uninsured losses. Uh, so, for example, an uninsured loss would be for a property uh, where a tree fell on your property that didn't hit your house or car. Uh, that would be what would be classified as an uninsured uh, uh, issue, uh, and I know there are thousands of those across uh, Prince Edward Island. So if, if, for example, a tree fell on your property that didn't hit your house at your primary residence, uh, that is what we would call an uninsurable loss, and that would be covered by this program. The parameters of this disaster program normally bring with them a $1,000 deductible to individuals and NGOs. During Hurricane Dorian and the response to that, we established a, uh, we waived the deductible for low, for a low income threshold. 
uh, but this time, uh, knowing that uh, that program helped many, uh, you know, in Dorian, uh, because of the extensive damage we've seen island-wide with Hurricane Fiona, uh, this, des this deductible we will be waived for all islanders and NGOs across the board. Uh, we know Islanders want to see the cleanup happen as fast as possible, and so do we. In the past, we have worked with municipalities to, to have a coordinated approach to this, and we would look to do the same again if it's possible. And just as an example for those who may have forgotten, during the Dorian cleanup, uh, as an example, the City of Summerside coordinated the approach for the city, for the residents, uh, and the program paid the city to do that. Uh, and it was a good, simple way to, and a fast and efficient way to get the cleanup done. So we'll continue to try to work with municipalities if we can to make it as simple as possible. Uh, in keeping with the cleanup and the recovery process, uh, it was very encouraging to hear that over 800 additional insurance adjusters licensed in Prince Edward Island are here and at work as quickly as possible to process as many claims for Islanders as island businesses as possible. I have been reassured by the Insurance Bureau of Canada that they are working with their member companies to get money into the hands of those impacted as soon as a claim is started and included in, the, in those expenses uh, could be alternative living expenses, food replacement, and other uh, areas as well. So that, that's encouraging. Uh, again, I would say to all Islanders, uh, if you or someone you know is in immediate need, if you could please call 211 or call the Red Cross. I think, Tanya, you'll be able to share that number uh, with, uh, with me as well, but it'll be on our website as well, so that we can connect those individuals to a resource as quickly as possible because we want to help as quickly as we can and, and make it as efficient as we can. Uh, finally, I would say that uh, on Tuesday, Minister Blois Thompson announced money for workers across PEI who lost shifts or hours due to business closures resulting from uh, Hurricane Fiona. Uh, we said at that time that we would cover up to $25 per hour, up to $1,000 a week, uh, and uh, that's been great uptake on that program so far, and we're now expanding that criteria to support those who are self-employed and those in the, what we call the gig economy who might be losing income here. So now you too are eligible for this program and can receive up to $1,000 a week, and the uh, links to our website will be made uh, available as soon as possible. Again, I would say to Islanders, uh, uh, telling you what you already know and what, what, what we've learned together, uh, we know when we announce these programs in an emergency situation such as, such as this, uh, while we do our best to cover as many Islanders as we can, we know we don't get everybody, but we're committed to continuing that help. So in the days ahead, we will continue to try to determine who needs help the most and try to get our programs tailored to get out to Islanders as quickly as possible. But it is a, you know, it is a difficult task uh, to identify uh, programs that will meet perfect need for 170,000 Islanders, but our cabinet, our cabinet committees, and so many workers inside of our government right now are working hard to do the best we can for all of you. So also, just finally, before I do turn it over to Tanya, I, I did want to take a moment uh, to say a special thank you and to offer my expression of gratitude for, again, those unsung heroes, those who are in our manors, our seniors' homes, our community community care facilities throughout our health care uh, system across PEI who have again gone above and beyond uh, gone above and beyond the call of duty to keep our special islanders safe and cared for and I just wanted to say again on behalf of all islanders thank you so much for that it means the world and uh, it makes PEI the best place in the world to live work and raise a family so with that I will turn it over to you Tanya for an EMO update great thank you premier um Welcome everyone, uh, myself as well, want to thank everyone for their patience and their continued commitment to uh, keep people safe, including uh, their families and their neighbors, uh, residents in their community all across the island. Um, before I start, I just did want to make a, a brief acknowledgement, just uh, considering what's happening currently down in the States in the southern U U.S., I know many islanders. Oh. Uh, certainly probably have friends and family uh, in Florida and the surrounding states and certainly uh, watching the news last night, uh, Hurricane Ian as it uh, slammed into Florida as a Category 4 storm. Uh, certainly, even with all the challenges that we're facing, I know Islanders are thinking and our thoughts are with those in Florida as well. Um, 
yesterday we had the privilege um, with the Premier and Minister Compton uh, to get up in the air with uh, Coast Guard uh, took us up for uh, a helicopter ride to survey damage uh, around the province. Um, it certainly was uh, eye-opening, uh, if you know, unprecedented amount of damage, and it was really uh, important for us to get an eagle's eye view of what that looks like, uh, so that will help kind of better position us to find where we need to put effort and what the resources uh, need to be in place for. I, I know I spoke about it yesterday, but as I said, I'm probably going to say it every day. Uh, safety is our primary concern for Islanders, so we again urge uh, that people use generators, barbecues, uh, candles, all those types of things. Make sure you're using them safely, um, not indoors. Make sure they're well ventilated, not leaving candles uh, unattended. Um, as well, when you're walking and driving, like it's, it's, it's really dark outside when there's no street lights and people's homes to light up the area. So making sure that people are being very cautious. If you are outside walking uh, outside um, uh, in dark, make sure that you're wearing something reflective. That would be really helpful for the cars that are on the road and there's trees and there's lines and there's all those types of things that uh, certainly can put us at risk. So just to be safe out there. We are at EMO uh, working really closely with our municipal affairs folks to support municipal reception centers. We're providing them food as the need, um, and they identify the need into us. So we're continuing to provide that support. Um, noting that reception centers, the, we do have a list up on our website, noting that some people may not be able to uh, access that. So there's a few other ways that you could certainly get that list. You could um, listen to the radio stations. They're providing that list as well. I know 211 also has that listing, and I do believe Kim mentioned it yesterday that uh, those that contact the centers that sometimes that that's an opportunity. We don't want to flood those, so try maybe try the try the other means first, um, and then if but if you're really struggling and you need to find out where those locations are, um, that is another opportunity. One of the things that I noted this morning, I was uh, just when I was up early and I was just getting ready to come into the office, uh, just kind of browsing through social media, I was amazed at, and I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be amazed, but I was um, impressed by the number of businesses that are continually offering um, use of freezers, free ice, um, coffee. What it, what, it was just impressive to see the volume and the variety um, of Islander spirit. And, you know, again, I think to the Premier's comment is that we do live in one of the most beautiful provinces, but I think um, the people are certainly showing um, the how and what that looks like even more in the last week. Um, Red Cross, um, as noted, uh, I do have a phone number, so I will give it to you in just a second, give you a chance to get a pen and paper. But we do have a solid uh, partnership and court working uh, cooperatively with them, uh, with Red Cross, in all the different communities, wherever their need uh, might exist. So the number that we encourage you to call is 1-800-863-6582. And what you'll do is they'll, we encourage you that you register through Red Cross. And when you do that, then they can then direct you to the right resources. They'll do a needs assessment, to determine what you need uh, in, er in order to keep you safe. So we encourage you to go that avenue. Um, they'll take care of you. They'll redirect you. They'll provide supports um, based on what your needs are. Before I hand it over to uh, Captain James Ryan, just one last statement. Uh, you know, tomorrow uh, many people uh, will be home recognizing a provincial statutory holiday uh, as a national holiday for truth and reconciliation. I did want to share that um, our office will be still fully staffed, and I know all the response and recovery um, people that are out in the road, uh, first responders, will still be uh, working to continue to support and restore the island, but we will be doing that in the most respectful way. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Captain James Ryan for his update. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to say that it's an honour um, and, and the Canadian Armed Forces are honoured to be here and, and help the Islanders uh, recover from uh, Hurricane Fiona. Um, since we've arrived on ground, we've been working hand in hand with the Emergency Management Office as well as Maritime Electric. Um, we're, we're providing some flexible aid to them that we are, we're not bound by organizations and, and we can be prioritized through the Emergency Management Office of, of where we're required to provide that assistance. Uh, while we're on ground, um, I, I would like to ask that uh, you, you provide my soldiers some uh, some working room. Uh, we, we do operate in very large vehicles that uh, not everyone might be used to seeing around. So I, I, I understand the attention draw and uh, the support we received. Uh, people coming up to say hello is, has been overwhelming and we were very grateful for the amount of support that we've received from the island. 
but uh, we, we would also uh, take safety into concern and, and just ask to give us some, a bit of room to work and say hello, especially if you see my soldiers out and about while they're not working. Uh, very, very happy of the support we've received and they're happy to say hello. Um, my other uh, thank you I'd like to say is to the Army Reserve augmentation from the island who's come out. Uh, they answered the call. They're, they're not obligated to, to come on and those are soldiers whose own homes and families uh, have been affected, but they've, they've signed on to work with my task force uh, while they're on the island. There's 34 of them here uh, working shoulder to shoulder with my soldiers and the organizations that we're supporting. So a huge out, uh, thank you to those. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kim from Maritime Electric. Thank you. Premier King, Tanya, Captain Ryan, and your task force team, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Our crews have made progress restoring power island-wide, and last night we hit a couple of milestones that I want to share with you today. With 50% of our customers restored overnight and 100% of our distribution lines going into communities energized. They have power, but that does not mean that every customer in your community has power. A little over 50% does. There are 137 crews on the road today, as well as resources with the Armed Forces and Forestry who mobilized to help us even more. And the Department of Transportation, as well as traffic controls, et cetera, more resources continue to be at Central and the East, and even more with our crews based on the Fiona impact. Over the next couple of days, we will have 197 crews on the island working with us. Since Saturday, Almost no one on PEI has had power. It's astonishing as we continue to reflect on this devastation across PEI. So now we have restored approximately 42,000 customers, which represents about 51% of our customers as of 30 minutes ago. That means about 70% of the West, 55% of Charlottetown, 35% of Central, and 30% of Down East has been restored. I do want to share a little more information with you about our system across PEI because I do talk about poles down and I wanted to share with you when I speak about poles down just to give you the idea of what the magnitude that that represents. When I talk about substations, we have over 30 across Prince Edward Island. Transmission poles, we have 8,700. Distribution poles in communities all across PEI, we have nearly 180, 100 and 38,000. So when I speak of saying that 504 poles are down right now, and I think that's the final of the numbers, we've got everything now, we're concerned, but we have stock, we have inventory, and we have supplies. We've had to date, as of 30 minutes ago, over 15,800 phone calls and messages for our customers in our on-island contact center, which is open 24-7. Not only do we have the information on the, st on the uh, warming stations and communities on our website, but our customer service reps have that information. If you don't have access to um, a website or um, that type of technology, mobile phone, etc., get to a ground line and call us. Right now, our latest report is that there's about 895 customer mass that have been reported down from our 82,000 customers. So what that means is as we start to restore these communities, there are going to be a number of customers across PEI that are going to take even longer and they'll be into the single outages and restoring them. These broken masks, once we have our communities on, will require electricians to help you. Our customer service reps have information on that as well as we have a detailed checklist on our website. Once we get the communities on, we will allocate crews to work at your home levels when the electricians are done. I know this is a historic storm for us, unlike anything we have ever experienced before. Our crews are working 16-hour days, and some you will see into the days and overnight. The vast majority you will see during the day, it's the most efficient time for us to work in daylight. If Islanders have been out or watched the media coverage and on social, I know you are rocked by what's happening in your life and your work and your family. And I just want you to power on and know that we're trying to get the power on for your home, businesses, families, and neighbors. This type of restoration work can be meticulous, and I do want to elaborate slightly on that. 
due to the extent and nature of the damages caused by this storm. Fiona hit us harder than any other storm, as I mentioned, in a hundred year history. We also have strict protocols in place to energize circuits safely, and that work is done manually by crews that are trained and certified personnel. The safety of our crews and you, our customers, is our number one concern. We have Islanders and we have lots of people here trying to help us too. This is a major part of our restoration effort and we want to keep everyone safe. We always have to take into consideration when planning that work. We inspect each line to, cons to confirm it's safe before we energize. That's part of the work that we do. That being said, we are optimistic about restoration efforts going forward. Much more, op pardon me, I'll start over. I'm not used to having notes, so. <laughs> that being said, we are optimistic about restoration efforts going forward. I'm hearing very positive sentiment from our crews and comments about the progress that they've been able to make under these circumstances and every day they become more optimistic. The weather has been on our side for the past couple of days and so far the forecast looks to continue to be in our favor. I realize that Islanders without power want to know a restoration time for their outage. At this point, while our crews are optimistic, as I mentioned before, we are not able to provide what we consider an accurate estimation when individual areas will be restored at this time. We do make more progress each day and I will provide any updates I can as we progress each day. Yesterday as we restored over 18,000 customers based on our work today and it's been a good day so far and the weather as I said is on our side for the next couple of days but we are expected to be into Sunday, maybe even Monday until we have communities restored and not sure on individual outages at this point. You may see better systems or what you see, you may be told are better systems. I can't really comment on that or what other provinces or utilities are doing. I don't feel comfortable giving a blanket restoration time X numbers of days or weeks out when we haven't done our assessments. We took two days doing our assessment. Our crews, we, we combine art and science to talk about it. We've had crews that have spent dozens of years on our lines, coupled with that and the history of PEI, they use that and the review of how long it takes to work on each part of our system. But I can tell you, some of the places that they arrived to even yesterday took two and three times longer than usual. Some places took 30 minutes. Every single situation has been different. We have a strong team on the ground and in our dispatch centers organizing the massive number of crews we are working with. As I mentioned, it is the largest storm of our history, but also the largest number of crews in our history at 137. That represents over 500 individuals working on power restoration at the field level. We are thankful for Fortis, Newfoundland Power, Fortis Alberta, and Fortis Ontario, and others who are here to help us, to help you. For safety, I want to remind Islanders to please continue exercising caution if you're out walking, driving, or clearing debris from your property. As we continue to energize the system, all down lines should always be treated as energized at this point. Please stay away from down lines and report them to us. If you have an emergency, you should dial 911 right away. I want to take a moment again today to thank Premier King for inviting us here to this event to update Islanders. As well as partners, first responders, emergency crews, so many of the public service behind the scenes trying to not only recover services through the pandemic and the health storm that we're just seeing the other side of and now to have Fiona. I also want to thank the media who attend and ask questions daily. I know you've been doing this for a couple of days now and I appreciate the questions being asked and for the media's help clarifying information for our customers. I understand your job and the deadlines that you are under to report the news and I commit to giving you what I know at any given time. Things like internet and cell reception have been difficult to access not only for us but others across the province. It's getting better. 
And but during the height of the storm, people were scared. And I know that people continue to be scared. So the media, you were very instrumental in helping us keep Islanders informed. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank all the Islanders who kept their battery operated radios listening in and trying to find out what was going on. People that kept their ground lines to be able to still call in and report their outages. I know that some days and most days are not good news. Even though I really wish they were. Either way, my comment to the media is ask me what you need to ask me. We are making progress and so thankful for the men and women that I work with at Maritime Electric. I'm really proud of them. I also want to thank our customers for their kindness. You have shown our crews and the Fiona restoration team. We have many, many island contractors, businesses, restaurants, hotels, and suppliers helping us who've left their homes to make sure that their businesses were up and running to look after you and to look after us. And of course, all the boots on the ground, as we say at work, at Maritime Electric across all of our departments. We've asked some people to do some different jobs and everyone has stepped up. Our contract center, as I mentioned, is open 24-7 and it will remain open 24-7 throughout our Fiona restoration efforts. It's your neighbors that are answering the phone when you call or email. We've received so many messages and notes of support from Islanders, from many individuals working on our restoration team, and I wanted to pass on their thanks and appreciation for that from everyone at Maritime Electric. I also know this is so hard not having your power on, and I promise you we have everyone that we can working on it. Please know that we really are here from you. We really are here for you. We're your neighbors. We're from the island, or we live next door, or in the community, or up the street, and we are working hard to safely restore power to you and all our customers as quickly as we can. So with that, I will just once again say thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to update, and I will pass it over to Premier King. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kim, and it's uh, good to hear we're making progress here. So um, we will now turn it over to some questions from our friends in the media. Brief Wright, The Guardian. Brief Wright, The Guardian. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I had my mute on. Uh, this is Rafe Rafe here from The Guardian. Question for Premier King. Uh, we have seen and we've received a lot of questions over the last few days from people wanting to understand the state of the trails along the Prince uh, around the island. Um, just this morning, I was at the uh, Confederation Trail and I saw people were walking around and running. So, but at the same time, there's also advisories to avoid these areas that are heavily affected with lots of trees down. So. My question is uh, to, Ms. to Premier King, uh, how long can it be before we can expect to see these trails cleaned up and what is your advice to Islanders as of right now? Uh, well, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think one thing we noticed yesterday uh, in doing the, the flyover was just the full extent of the damage and how uh, consistent it is across the, the country, uh, or across the province, sorry. Um, uh, in terms of uh, Confederation Trail, I mean, I would ask all islanders to be very careful. Uh, I don't know which trails are open at this point. We've been focusing the bulk of our efforts right now on trying to, uh, you know, get the electricity back on for islanders and to make sure they have their uh, food, water, and other essentials they need to get through this difficult time. Uh, I know through the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure and, and Tourism uh, and other departments that we will start to look at assets such as that in the days ahead. I, I'm not sure as to uh, uh, what the situation is all across PEI. I'm sure uh, because the trails are in wooded areas, I'm sure there's extensive damage, but we've really been trying to prioritize our response to get our roads open and, uh, and to try to get life back to normal. But I can get someone to get in touch with you from uh, either of those departments to let you know what the progress would be. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Do you be the guardian? Hi, good afternoon all. Uh, I guess uh, first question to Ms. Mullally. Uh, so I'd asked a question yesterday about uh, the wireless wireless infrastructure, um, and you'd mentioned that uh, 
the telecoms have basically reported that all the systems are fully operational. But I'm wondering, as of today, have you been provided with like a percentage of mobility towers, cell towers, island-wide that are up to full service, full service capacity, and can you share that? So I do know when we did our morning briefing this morning, we have several of our partners, I do believe uh, all the main providers in the province uh, on with us, some of them in person and some of them on the call. I can't say that they gave that, that specific percentage number. I know that they said that, again, some of them are still on battery or generator power, so until that power is restored. But I haven't heard that they had network issues, but I don't want to say anything more than that. So I'm going because I don't want to give you the wrong information. Uh, so perhaps what I can do is I can get that um, and, you know, we can provide it back to you either uh, later today or tomorrow if that's OK. Yeah, sure. I guess the, the reason the reason I ask and, and this, this is leading into another question. Uh, but the reason I ask is because I have contacted each of the major telcos uh, and I've also heard from customers who are still reporting service disruptions. It's really difficult for Islanders to really know what is happening with the network, what, what capacity it's at. Um, so I guess second question, have you been provided the percentage of uh, cell customers who experienced service disruption at the peak of the storm, like over the weekend, to the point where they would not have been able to access 911 services? Like, have you been provided that information from the telcos? I haven't actually asked that specific question. I'll, I'll say that. Um, and I wish I was more fluent with how the 911 and cell phone towers, I do know that even um, if people from a landline can still call. Um, and, and again, I, I know it's very technical, So, and I'm not. Anyone that knows me, uh, that's not my ex area of expertise. So again, if I could ask, if I could just take that information back and then we can get that to you. Would appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Okay, no uh, one quick one for Ms. Griffin. Um, have, uh, have all mobility and wireless towers been fully connected to I guess I guess the grid. I guess we'll call it you know maritime electric. Like are they are they all connected? Or are are we sure that none of them are running on backup generators at this point? I'm not sure. I have a list that I look at, and then I depending on the region with the civic, it goes to um, whether it's east, west, or central as part of our restoration efforts, and um, we have them on our list. But I'd, I'd have to check specifically. Um, I think we've checked them all, but I'm not sure whether or not their energization status. So I can I can check on that uh, whether or not um, whether they're battery gas. I'm not sure that specifically, but um, I, I can check on that and uh, follow up with you in terms of what we've checked. I do have I think most of those towers, but um, you're only as good as the as the list you have. So I just I just want to make sure, and I'll, I can follow up with you immediately following this briefing and check. Okay. Would appreciate that. Uh, I guess last one to Premier King. I mean, uh, you know, so we, we of course have had uh, Ms. Griffin from uh, Maritime Electric answering questions, but um, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult to tell the status of the mobility network and indeed home internet services, you know, wireless towers. Do you believe the telcos have a responsibility to be more transparent with customers about the status of this critical infrastructure in PEI? Uh, yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Steve McKay, CBC. Hey, folks. Uh, I know, Kim, you said no timeline, but you've met the milestone of about halfway now. So what's the next milestone? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. I mean, what, what I've been looking at is we've been looking at our, at our progress and the number of crews that we have on the road and the areas that we're working on. So. Um, I think what we're what we're trying to do is look at those numbers and, and break it down even more so tonight. Um, I didn't have all of that information for today's briefing. Um, I'll be honest about that. Um, you know, we're trying for another eight to ten thousand. Uh, I'm just not sure if that if that's going to happen. So. Um, I actually look at every day with the numbers going up in terms of who we're restoring as, as our milestone. So we have some internal cheers, but I know that we have a long ways to go yet. You had mentioned Sunday or Monday morning just as a vague uh, idea. Could you clarify what you meant by that about getting power back on those two days? Well, I, I was asked and I continue to be asked about restoration times, which I understand and that, that people are looking for a, a better time frame. 
So um, I've listened to that and I've talked to our crews and our leadership and we've combined that with our team to have that discussion of, you know, what, what do we think based on the, the progress that we made even yesterday? And um, I think that the daily updates are valuable to people. That's certainly what I'm hearing, but I think people continue to want to plan further ahead. And so um, I wanted to be optimistic that it's, it's not going to be tomorrow. It's probably not going to be all Saturday, and we could be into Sunday and Monday. And that's not talking about individual outages. That's talking about communities all across Prince Edward Island in east and central and west, primarily central and east at this point, from what I can tell. Okay. That, uh, We're hearing oh, that. Could I just add, because uh, I mean, I know that... Uh, you know, we're into day six, I think it is, uh, so far, and, and I know that, uh, I mean, w when I left home this morning, I was amongst the, um, now thankfully, the minority who, who do not have their electricity, but um, I know that the urgency to get it back, and what we're trying to work with now, Minister Myers and his department and others are working closely with Maritime Electric as we figure out more and more about what the next few days look like uh, so we can have a coordinated response to get into communities, to get extra assistance, uh, whether they be with generators, with hot food, etc., into those areas that might be taking longer. So I would just say that, the, that that's where we're at with, with, uh, with the status as we work our way through this. I know we're getting into multiple days and I know how frustrating that is, and, and uh, as I say, but I think we have a good coordination effort between Maritime Electric uh, and between uh, Minister Myers and the Energy Corporation and other uh, staff members uh, to try to do everything we can to make this as tolerable as possible for Islanders as it extends into multiple days. Yeah. confirm that premier yeah. that in terms of the discussions um, there is no shortage of people asking on restoration as everyone knows that's the that's the number one question um, but in terms of uh, both Minister Myers and the Energy Corp trying to help coordinate with us what are those pockets what's what's what are those areas in central and and east we will not only be deploying either more crews or any and all crews that way once we have the the west on any of the remaining and all the new crews um, we also, the task force has been instrumental, particularly in the East um, and uh, today, um, but also that, that whole discussion around um, the government is asking us those questions around what pockets and what communities do we think that we're going to be, ha be able to have on, and I assure you that I am trying to get that information. So no uh, information on those uh, pockets or communities that may be next up to get power back. Yes, and, and as I mentioned earlier, like there's some times where our crews are getting there and they're estimating on the field this could take a couple of hours and sometimes it turns out a little bit longer. So um, I, I was trying to mention later into the weekend so that optimistically people could perhaps understand that it won't be Friday and it might not be Saturday and it might not be Sunday so that they could try and do better planning. That, that's what I'm hearing from people, and I understand 100% what people are asking of us. Yeah, two quick ones. Uh, we're hearing that the 211 line, Access PEI, or Maritime Electric lines, are all dealing with huge call volumes. Any talk about adding more capacity to those lines at all? I can speak to uh, Maritime Electric specifically on call volume. Um, we've expanded our lines, and we have a virtual contact center, so we have a redundancy plan built in, um, not only to be able to do it out of our Main Street, Kent Street office, but also our, our reps being able to do it at home. Um, I don't want anyone to hesitate to phone us to ask questions. We've brought in um, some of our retired employees as well to assist with that, and, um, and we can take thousands and thousands of calls. Yeah, and uh, I know 211 has been busy. I mean, as more and more of our employees are coming back, uh, as I say, are, to, to work, we're able to add more and more. Uh, we're working with our NGOs like Red Cross, as Tanya said, so they're able to take some of the call volumes as well. Uh, you know, we want everyone to reach out who's in need so we can uh, get out there and respond as quickly as we can. And, and so more and more resources are being added, uh, you know, by the hour and by the day. And uh, But uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, there's... There's a lot of calls uh, about a lot of things. And one last one before I get out of your hair. Um, any contractors helping to come help people reattach electrical masts to their house? I know you mentioned masts earlier, Kim. 
type of contractors? What do you mean in terms of the crews that we have coming to assist Maritime Electric? Yeah, potentially. Just wondering if people have broken masks or have damage to them. Uh, is there sort of help coming instead of contacting individual electricians, which is still possible, but is there crews coming to help work on those masks? Well, let me check particularly, like the crews right now are absolutely focusing on the restoration efforts, completely uh, completely focused on that. In terms of certification, um, you, you need a certified electrician to do that work um, on the home side or the other, what we call the, the other side of the meter. So in terms of that, um, if depending upon the damage, it's, it's really a, a, a multi-partner process. So um, the crews that we have are particularly focused on on the power restoration side, um, but customers will need us at the beginning as well as an electrician and then to come back. So there will be a, a need for a number of electricians to help support once we have the communities back on. Understood. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Terry Campbell, CBC. Good afternoon. Thanks for the chance to ask questions. Um, uh, Kim, I want to say thank you for your comments about the media, because I feel like maybe it seemed like we were on opposite sides or something yesterday, and I don't want to be on the, the other team. Um, I want to follow up on Cody's question, just so I understand, when you say that hopefully we'll be um, connected or have communities restored Sunday or Monday, uh, but not individuals, what work then is left to do? What individuals or how many or what circumstances are they in if they're not connected? Is it the people who need work on their masks with an electrician? Is it people whose line, you know, to the to the main electric cable came off? What work is left to do once you reach that point? Okay, great question, actually. Um, I didn't hear the first part of your comment very well, so I'll just smile. Um, but for, for the, the question about the, the system carry, um, you know, as I always say, ask me anything and I'll do my best to answer it. That, that's a good point because when I'm talking about individual outages, we actually don't know down to the house yet. So part of the restoration efforts is that once we start to get the communities back on, we actually, many customers will know this from storms, we actually sometimes, after we have all the communities back on, we may actually start asking customers, if you're not back on, make sure you contact us because there could be other issues outside of the mass, but there could be other um, components that are, that are problematic. They could have another line down. So that's a good point because our jargon in-house in is about, you know, individuals. So right now we are focusing on those large communities, but, but we could have, you know, thousands of, of individual outages that could have other problems. We just don't know that yet. So we don't know that until we start re-energizing those communities. I was just trying to give people um, the ballpark of into the weekend so that they could plan over the next couple of days as best they could. You know, knowing that as you look across the island, and I have the percentage breakdown, I think, by community um, in terms of the percentages that are restored at this point, um, at minimum uh, at the substation side. Um, so when we look at that and say um, when they come back on, there could be a period as, as customers are saying, well, you know, everyone across the street's on or my whole town is on, but I'm not on and they're calling us. So we're going to keep our, our contact center staffed up in case we have to deal with those. So there's stages of the storm is what I'm saying in the restoration effort. So I'm, I'm not trying to be complicated. I'm just trying to say that the next layer for us is to try and get every community on. And then we're, we don't know at this time how many individual outages um, or individual customers that still may remain out. Right now we have about 900 customers that have called us and reported that they have problems with their masks or have reached out to an electrician and we're noting that on their customer file. Okay, thank you. That helps a lot. Um, I, I've seen a couple reports that there may have been crews based in PEI not maritime electric crews, this would be with maybe one of the third party contractors that you might normally use, um, but that they went to Nova Scotia in advance of the storm um, that maybe maritime electric wasn't going to pay them to be on standby and Nova Scotia power was. Are there crews that are from PEI that could have been available that you didn't have on standby? Anything to this effect and is there a I guess a company policy that dictates what you do in a situation like this. 
Yes, Carrie, I'm uh, I'm aware of uh, that rumor or that comment, um, and I actually did uh, was referencing that note on social. Someone had actually shared it with me about an hour before. I apologize, I hadn't seen it before, but I, I need to look into that. Um, I, I can tell you, like, I'm not exactly sure what other utilities do. Um, there's some contractors that we refer to internally as storm chasers. Um, and there's some that they, they look around and see uh, if they can get there a week ahead and, and, and maybe be, be paid around the clock, then that's maybe what some of them are doing. But, but I can assure you that the, the contractors that, that we have, we had no problems. I don't think we had anyone that said no to us that we called, but I can, I can check into that. I mean, this is definitely our largest restoration effort, and um, we, um, we, we don't seem to be having problems getting crews or contractors. The challenges that we're having has been primarily around making sure that they're, they're certified um, as whether they're a power line, te a power line technician, excuse me, or utility arborist if needed. So, um, but I, I can check into that for you as well. Um, we do have a number of crews that are still coming and, and um, we haven't had many problems trying to, to access them. The challenge has really just been, it takes a couple of days on the assessment to make sure you know how bad the damage is. And one can decide, do you, do you bring that many in just before a storm and hold them? If you look at Teddy, um, that never happened. There were utilities across the country that, that had a lot of crews on standby. And uh, it was a pretty significant hit financially for their customers to pay for later. So um, I think it's a judgment call, to be quite honest. Um, that has not been slowing our efforts down. All right, thank you. Uh, my next question is for the Premier. I know you mentioned that you have an announcement tomorrow on uh, uh, more support for Islanders. I'm guessing you've been hearing what I've been hearing today, some people who feel that they've been left out from some of the funding that was announced yesterday. And then um, you, you said what we've heard before, that if people need immediate help, they could call, well, the Red Cross is one, but also 211, and that they could be connected to resources. I just maybe want a better understanding of what resources are available for for anyone who's in that situation where they want help now, but, you know, instead of waiting for the announcement tomorrow and for whatever the, the rollout of that is, what are the resources that are available if people can, you know, get through on 211? Well, I appreciate the question, uh, Carrie. I don't pay attention to social like maybe you or Kim do, uh, but I do have a pretty good idea of uh, what Islanders are thinking because I try to spend as much time as I can in the communities with them. And uh, uh, I, as I, when we made some announcements yesterday, you know, I've been saying this from the beginning of, of COVID and even beyond that is that we announce a policy for as many people as we can, but what you hear on the back end as an individual is, how does this affect me or how does it not affect me? So that's just the nature of the beast of the, of the, of the work that we're in. So what we tried to announce yesterday was to get money out to those people who we have general regular contact with so we know we have their information, we can get their money out to them quickly, and that's what we announced. Uh, we announced money to NGOs and not-for-profits and community groups because they're on the ground as well and they know who are the most vulnerable, those who are in need, and those in, in communities who may not be part of our government roles or regular customers but are, are, are clients but need help right now. So that's how we're trying to get out as quickly as possible. Uh, and we are really trying to develop policies and, and government programming uh, in, in an emergency situation to help as many people as we can, as fast as we can, and knowing that we don't get, uh, we don't get everybody. But uh, if you were to call into 211 in immediate need, we would to de determine what your immediate need is uh, and then direct resources to get them to quickly. Some people are might need food, some people might need money, gas money, whatever it is, uh, and that's how we're dealing with those individuals, and that's what we'll continue to do. But, it, you know, I, as I said at the offset and have said from the beginning, it's, it's a very imperfect science that we're uh, trying to operate under here. Yeah, no, that's fair. And just so, is it a, a grocery card, a gas card? And how do you get that to people? How do they get that in their hands? Uh, that, that's, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, you've been around a long time. You, you were at the spring legislature session, so you know uh, uh, giving money away is harder than it would seem or that most people would think it would be. But uh, in this regard, it, it all depends on what the individual person needs. If it could be a grocery card, it could be some money for, for gas, it could be uh, uh, any number of things. So it's really on an individual type basis uh, what we can do. We're trying to be as flexible and understanding as we can uh, because each individual islander or family has different needs and 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 so it's uh it's it's any of those things it's all of those things or or a combination uh of, of those things all right and if i could a little two-parter um i don't know if the premier wants to get the first part or maybe tang you know <coughs> if you want to jump in uh, i'm not trying to armchair quarterback this but we've seen how hard this has been on vulnerable populations including seniors I know one suggestion I've seen is, should we have backup generators, you know, with each government senior's housing complex so people don't end up the dark in the dark? Um, there's a quick one. And then I wonder, this would be for the Premier, will, you kind of hinted at this yesterday, will you commit to a post-recovery review, something like government uh, commissioned after Dorian, so that we can kind of learn all these lessons and, and so we can be, try to be better prepared next time? I, I appreciate those uh, questions, and, and uh, um, uh, I guess uh, I respect the, uh, the the reference to armchair quarterback, and I understand uh, uh, where it comes from. I mean, we are really trying to, uh, uh, you know, history ticks in real time, and, and we're in real time here, uh, trying to make these decisions as fast as we can. Uh, are there things that we've learned from Fiona that we will employ better the next time? I think absolutely. Uh, will we commit to uh, doing a full review of, of our response uh, and our lead up to it to make sure we try to be better prepared next time and uh, be uh, maybe faster positioned to react? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, this is hard-earned experience that we're all learning here, not just as government, but as islanders in general. So yes, we will do that. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, it, you know, we want to do the best we can to look after all of our islanders, in particular those most vulnerable. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, 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 I'm the first to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can always do better and we need to do better. And, and I'll endeavor uh, as long as I'm here to try to do better. So, yeah, um, a full review, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Oceane Doucette, Radio Canada. Uh, I actually got my questions answered already, so thank you. Mike McDonald, Canadian Press. Hi, thanks for the opportunity uh, to ask some questions today. Premier King, um, earlier you were asked whether the telcos were being transparent with Islanders, and you gave a very brief answer, and I want to provide you with the opportunity to expand on that, as you know, the Nova Scotia Premier um, Tim Houston was voluble yesterday talking about how he felt telecommunications companies were not being transparent, were not being cooperative, and not being accountable. And he called on the federal government to do something about it. What do you think? Well, I was asked, did I think they could do a better job? And I said, yes, because I think we all could do a better job. Uh, I didn't really talk or address whether I thought they were being transparent or not. I think, as I said yesterday, uh, their representatives are sitting around our emergency table and, and we're, we're probably better equipped than most uh, to, ha to be nimble enough to be able to do that. So, uh, look, I think throughout this whole exercise, we've, uh, we've come to know that uh, there are things that uh, we need to be better prepared for in the future future and I and I think uh, the telcos have, uh, telecoms have, have a role to play in that the government of PEI the government of Canada has a role to play in that our utility and so many others so uh, I'm just not sure at this particular time where we're at in our response trying to get people back to some kind of normal life if now is the time to start uh, uh, you know throwing arrows and 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 and, and picking fights uh, we're going to focus on trying to get the job done here and there'll be there'll be lots of time to fix and fight later I just one other quick question for the um, Premier King. Um, I think I heard you say earlier that um, your situation individually, do you have power back? And if so, when did you get it? 
and I don't need to be singled out any more than any other Highlander is. Uh, I, I was just saying that I can relate to those who are frustrated because when I left this morning, uh, uh, I, we didn't have power, but we're fortunate enough to have a generator, so we have all that we need. So I don't need anyone out there thinking that I'm trying to sympathize or, or to be any different th or than anybody else. I'm just trying to, for context of a question, say that I can s stress the frustration. Look at my, uh, you know, look at my hair. I haven't been able to wash and, and shave to the extent that I'd like to, but, but you know, I'm, I'm doing fine. And I'm more concerned about the rest of Prince Edward Island who are out there struggling and, and trying to get through this, and I'm just trying to work with all of our partners to get through it as fast as possible. But I, I appreciate you asking. Thanks very much. Thank you. Teresa Ray, Global News. Hi there. Um, my question is for uh, the Premier. Um, yesterday I was at a provincially owned um, seniors complex and the seniors there were, um, they are stumbling around in dark hallways um, downstairs, very dangerous situation. Nobody has gone to check on them. Nobody, they have not received any assistance. Um, why hasn't more been done or have been more immediate support for seniors, um, whether it's bringing them meals, whether making sure they have transportation? A lot of these people, they don't have landlines because a lot of landlines are now internet-based, so they can't call 211 for immediate assistance. Why is not more being done to help seniors now? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, no, sorry. Um, can you hear me there? Okay, we're good. Uh, uh, which uh, facility you're referring to? I, I was uh, in a meeting this morning with Minister McKay and Minister Hudson, and, and we were talking about uh, issues such as this. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working hard uh, to try to make sure we're dealing with everybody that we can deal with and help them to the extent we can. Uh, I, I would need to get a little bit more of a uh, detailed brief as to uh, which particular facility uh, that we haven't visited. I, I, I was told by both ministers and their staffs that we have been making regular visits. So uh, if that's conflicting information, I'd look into that a little bit more deeply. But, uh, uh, you know, we've been through a really difficult time here and uh, we're, we're, we're trying our best to, to kind of recover, to rebound and, and to make our way back. And uh, it does send me to hear that... Uh, some of those uh, individuals uh, are uh, in the situation they're in, and I hope we can fix that as soon as we can. Um, we heard today that some people may not um, be uh, restored or power may not be restored um, until Sunday or Monday, and a lot of ind other individuals, uh, it could take much longer than that. Um, we're obviously, the, de the damage has been catastrophic to homes, businesses, and to a number of our primary industries. Why haven't you called a state of, of emergency? Well, I think this is a question we've dealt with six or seven times now. Everything that we need to do, we need to do. A state of emergency would only be needed if we're not able to do something currently under our existing legislation and we're able to do that. It's much different than in the United States or other places where a state of emergency is called early so they can have access to funds and do other things that they need to do uh, that our legislation currently allows us to do. As I've said, Teresa, from the beginning, this is an emergency. We've been dealing with it as an emergency. Emergency. We have everything we need to execute uh, or to deliver on our programs, and it's just been uh, it's been uh, all hands on deck, and and that continues to be our approach. But I mean, Tanya has explained time and again what a state of emergency does, and if Tanya, if you want to take one more go at it. <laughs> sure. I guess uh, just to add, and I guess, or to restate, um, again, we've talked about this on several occasions, both in advance and, and post Fiona, but, um, you know, the purpose around the state of emergency, as the Premier said, is to uh, have the ability or the authority to do something that we don't have the power to do. The examples I often use are if we needed to evacuate, create a mandatory evacuation of a place, we would need to uh, create a state of emergency to do that. If there was price gouging, we need to do price fixing or rationing of anything. Again, we don't have legislation, so we would need to do that in order to um, to keep people safe, keep people, property, and, and the environments, um, protect all those. So I don't know if there's any way to be make that more clear. Thank you. Uh, and and I, I know you mentioned um, that giving money away is harder than it appears. Um, perhaps, Premier, you could try to explain why that is. 
because we're hearing a lot from people who feel that there's been no immediate assistance for them. They don't know what to do. And that, you know, especially people who aren't covered by the programs that you announced so far, um, why is it that, you know, there, there can't be more immediate help for people, whether it's money, whether it's meals, whether it's generators? Um, and especially if, if that's true, if it's really hard for you to find a way to get money to people, what, what are you doing to perhaps consult with the federal government, which was able to roll out money very quickly to people during the pandemic? Yeah, look, uh, I, I, I really appreciate you asking that question because I'm sure when people hear that, uh, they think it can't be possible. So uh, government really doesn't do checks for anymore or, or any significant check runs, for example. Uh, government doesn't deal in cash. Uh, <laughs> and uh, most of our tax rolls, is, uh, like every other province, is handled by CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, there's also privacy issues and stuff. So it's not just as simple as um, you calling in, giving me your information and us trying to find a way to get you a check. It, it, it is. It's just. It's a very complicated, cumbersome process. While we try to give money quickly to NGOs and other groups because they have more nimbleness and more flexibility to get money out the door, uh, and they know how to get it directly into somebody's hands a little bit more efficiently than we do. Uh, the federal government, uh, you know, I think through COVID uh, w was an exceptional type circumstance. I don't know, uh, based on the conversations we've had leading up to this, uh, that uh, you know, it's usually about 30 or 60 or 90 days to get CRA to do a, a run, a special run. Uh, it's, it's something that we continue uh, to contemplate whether or not we can ask for something a little faster than that, but it, 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 it's, it's more difficult than that. So, uh, you know, generators or food, that is easy. I mean, we can get those things a little bit more quickly than others, but I mean, getting straight hard money into somebody's bank account or getting a check into their hands or something like that, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it's complicated. So that's why we're trying to work around all the factors that we're working around and trying to find uh, creative ways to, to do this and to get it quickly into the hands of those who need it the most. So I'm sorry for the long roundabout answer, but that, that's what we've been trying to do. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a frustration for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Joey Black here. Uh, can you hear me, Premier? Loud and clear, Joey. How are you, buddy? Good, good. Uh, how has this hurricane affected seniors along with uh, the vulnerable sector, including adults with disabilities and their mental health? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question, Joey, and I think it's impacted everybody uh, dramatically, and in particular those groups that, that you mentioned. I mean, uh, individuals with mobility issues would be impacted trying to move around the streets right now of any community because of the cleanup efforts. And, you know, I think we've heard some previous questions about some of the challenges with our senior population, uh, et cetera. So we're really trying hard here to respond as quickly as we can. And, and uh, you know, we've been, uh, we've been hit with a big... Uh, a pretty big smash here, as you know, and and uh, and it's it's been an all hands on deck trying to make our way past uh, past it and and and, and through it, and, and that continues. And we're just we're just here trying to help as hard as we can. And is you have, do you have any kind of timeline that the, this will be uh, all cleaned up? Oh, geez. All cleaned up, Joe. Man, that might be a longer grind, uh, you know, just because of the sheer volume of, of d damage and destruction that we've seen. I mean, uh, uh, you know, right now we've been really just trying to reestablish, uh, you know, our links to communities or our, our electricity and, and trying to get people back to some kind of normal uh, understanding and living. But I mean, you know, we did the tour yesterday that we talked about the, you know, the, uh, the, the tops of the wharves at Redhead Harbor are in the middle of the bullpen and, and the, you know, the, the uh, solar farm at Summerside is, is, you know, a third smashed to pieces before it's even gone online. There's so much damage here that I, I, it's going to be hard to give you a hard and fast time frame and when it will be all cleaned up. But, uh, you know, we, we're making progress a day at a time, and it's, it's, it's the way we're going to have to approach this for the next little while. But uh, I'm hoping every day it gets a little bit better, a little bit easier, and hope we can keep that momentum. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Joey.
That's all the questions we have. Oh. Joe, we might have yeah. one more there. Uh, yeah. I've, I've got one for uh, Kim. Okay. Uh, in, all, in all your years, Kim, uh, with Maritime Electric, have been, even with Maritime Electric, have you ever seen this much, the amount of poles and transformers down in the, with this hurricane? I have to think about that for a minute. Um, not that I'm that old, the company's over 100 years old, but I, I want to think about when we had the ice storm of 2008 or 9, we had seven, eight, I think we had 900 poles that were, that were down, um, but it was much more of a targeted area where, where it got hit in the end, and the same as um, Juan, it was very targeted. In terms of um, Dorian, that was island-wide in terms of the damage and destruction. But um, no, when I think about Fiona, to your questions, per particularly on poles and, and other pieces of equipment that we have, um, I think it's more I've seen were I've never seen as, as much damage or destruction on, on the island. Um, we had much more uh, with transmission. Uh, during Dorian, and um, we took some of our key learnings from Dorian in terms of vegetation management or essentially tree trimming that we worked on since Dorian, um, as well as we've continued to invest in, in tree trimming across the island, and that's been something. So um, let me circle back and say I don't think I've ever seen this type of destruction um, of this magnitude on the island. Um, and secondly, in terms of the, the poles down and the distribution, the biggest challenge for us at the very beginning was much like a, a snowstorm when you're trying to get the roads clear of snow. We're now trying to get the roads clear of trees and debris. So, um, but I think all in all, I, I think our net net, as I say sometimes, I, I think it's been the worst that I've ever seen in my history at Maritime Electric. Thank you very much, Kim. You're welcome. Uh, one for oh. Tanya, maybe not, if I can. Absolutely. Uh, when planning for any kind of emergency and how much prep work uh, went into the into this, and did you ever expect this much devastation? So that's a wonderful question. I guess uh, for those that don't know what EMO does, uh, that's what we do every day in advance of an, any event is we, pre we prepare. We have four stages of emergency management that we speak to is mitigation, preparedness, then response and recovery. Um, we would prefer to say that we spend very little time in response and recovery, but in the last few years, it's been not quite that. Um, we like to say that we spend most of our time in preparedness. So we're constantly working with all those stakeholders that are around our table today, um, and we're preparing, we're planning, we're thinking, we're exercising, we're training. Um, that is what we do every single day. Have I ever, would I have ever thought that we had seen, would see this much devastation? I would say no, um, but I think if we go roll back the, the calendar a couple of years, we could say, um, you know, pre-March 2019, seems like a long time ago, um, would anybody have thought that we would be um, participating in a global pandemic? So we try to always plan for the worst, hope for the best. I think that was one of the first words we spoke of, but um, I think what, what we experienced, what we think might be our worst and hope is our worst. And I think, um, but we plan for it every day. The challenge for us is that we can't plan for every scenario to Premier's comment. We can't create uh, means to do some of the delivery of programs um, in, to its completeness. We can think about it, but we can actually implement it. So we, it, planning and preparing uh, is, uh, is very complex and, and takes a lot of time as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, Joey. Uh, can we wrap Captain, her up, Joe? I, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom, Joe. Can we wrap her up here pretty soon? Or well, We've been yeah, on here for an hour and a half. Huh? Uh, Captain Ryan. Uh, what challenges have you 
you, you're, you had in, in cleaning up along with power lines, poles, when they, are, when they come down. Uh, well, that is challenging, and, and as Kim mentioned, you needed to have specialized training to work in, around the power lines. Uh, not a lot of my soldiers are, are trained to work along the power lines, so that's why we're working hand-in-hand -hand with uh, Maritime Electric. So they can, they can do the work in and around the power lines, and then we can assist them both directly on the site, but also indirectly by opening up uh, additional roads for them to, to bypass and get around to the areas they need to get to or, or, or get on power lines from the opposite direction. Um, so that's a challenge in itself. Um, a, a big part of my challenge is, is having our soldiers uh, stay on task and get where they are. They're, they want to help everyone and, and do everything that they can for everyone out around the province. And, and we're prioritizing our efforts in accordance with uh, the Emergency Management Office, uh, working hand in hand with Maritime Electric. But uh, my soldiers just, they want to help, they're eager to help, and they're, they're dying to help everyone around here. So that's my challenge is, is keeping them on task, keeping them from straying away, keeping them from cleaning up everyone's personal yard, because that's, they want to help everyone and, and possibly if they can. So that's, that's my biggest challenge right now. Thank you very much, Captain. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, Kim. Captain Ryan, uh, Tanya, thank you very much. And uh, Tyler Islanders will be back in touch again tomorrow. So thank you.